Welcome back to Small Business Big Lessons, a Buffer original series. My name is Haley. I work in communications and content at Buffer. And in this podcast, we explore business stories like you have never heard before with a group of incredible and inspiring small business owners. They are building successful businesses while doing good in communities and around the world. We're going to uncover the big lessons that we can learn from these small businesses. In this episode, we're going to be looking at letting go. As the world around us seems to be changing at an ever-growing pace, in order to maintain the success of your business, it's essential to change with it. As markets, trends, and demographics shift, standing still is not an option, and failure to react to shifting times can mean you get left behind. It's also important to acknowledge that we as people are always changing, and the tried and true methods you've used to run your business in the past may not be serving your interests in the present day. Part of the journey of small business ownership sometimes involves letting go, branching out into new areas, and trying new things. This could be letting go of areas of responsibility as your business grows, letting go of expectations as you respond to customer demands, or letting go of previously held beliefs that are holding you back. While changing and rethinking how you work can be exciting and fulfilling, it can also be a source of stress and uncertainty. So how do you navigate these changes when your heart is telling you one thing and your head another? In this episode, we're bringing you stories about letting go, taking that leap, and moving forward. Here's Holly with some great advice about breaking out of limiting mindsets and entrenched beliefs. So there's an author, her name is Byron Katie, and I'd say she's known as a self-help author, but she has this famous phrase, is it true? And the whole idea of this phrase, is it true, is that you should always be asking yourself that. Is it true? Is the opposite true? When we're stuck in those mindsets, I always just say like, is it true? And challenge people to think about that and find evidence that it might not be true, that the opposite could be true. And so is it true is a helpful way to sort of play with this idea of letting go with entrenched beliefs. Because sometimes when we are challenged around our entrenched beliefs, we can get really triggered, right? And we can double down and we can hold tight to things because those beliefs have been our safety. For many people starting a small business, there may come a time when you need to transition from working your day job to running your business full time. Taking this leap and stepping into the uncertainty of self-employment can come with a large amount of financial stress as well as adjusting to the newfound responsibility that comes with working on your own terms. Here are Becky and Hugh from Painter with their story of letting go of their jobs and jumping into the unknown. I resigned on my birthday as a gift to myself because I was so excited to go into Painter full time. That was a really, really exciting day and then followed quite quickly with, oh my God, what do I do? all day. Hugh followed later because he wanted to split the risk of not both jumping in at the same time. And so suddenly I was at home thinking, well, where can I be of use? What do I do? I think it was lucky that I waited until after batch number one because we had customers and we, we really did have a lot to do. It was everything I'd wanted and it was also really intimidating at the same time because you don't have a boss or a mentor that you have in a bigger company that you can say, I'm struggling with this or can I just check this with you? Suddenly it's it's us and we were also long distance so I was having to check in with you over WhatsApp or calls at lunch but also you know, making sure that he was still giving everything to his full-time job because we didn't know that he would be joining at that time. Also, I had a notebook of freelance ideas that I will get stuck into if Painter doesn't work. I found it the other day, all sorts of random, not great ideas, but we had to be thinking about what would happen if things didn't work as well. You're also in control of your own learning, which is an amazing thing, but also it means you have to be very self-directed. You have to constantly check, where do I think I'm not great? What's uncomfortable about my day job? How could I be better? Asking each other for advice and being able to give each other like truthful answers about what we need to get better at, because if we're doing painter full-time forever, which is exactly what we want to do, then no one's going to come in and say, hey, can I teach you guys some things? Like... We have to go after those things ourselves, so no one's coming to help you. You've chosen a hard route. It's interesting because like all our lives, we'd wanted to have our own business, but it's actually really 
hard for me to leave my job to do it because I was in a position, I was in a company that I absolutely loved. I loved the people there. I loved the purpose of the business. I loved doing my job every day. And so I was like, it was hard to even like think about leaving. So I was like, this whole like team around me, I like absolutely loved them. It wasn't until my boss actually told me after batch two that he was like, he sat me down and said, you should go do this full time. It seems to be working. Like before you have kids, before you get a mortgage, before you have anything that ties you down, go take that risk. And lots of people just like jump at it. Some people like, oh, they, they register a business and they quit their jobs. And we love what we did. And we were really careful about when we took the leap. Because like in the early days, a business is, it's your baby. And you can't expect that baby to pay for your life on its first year and its second year. You need to give it time to stand its own two legs and then it can help you out. I think if you put too much pressure on yourself or on your business too early on in the business's life, you can end up making the wrong decisions. And we were very conscious of not putting the pressure on the business to provide in any way, just so we could build a business in the way that we wanted, making sure that we could try something out because we wanted to, not because it had to make sense financially. Sometimes to move forwards with one life plan, we need to let go of another. Kelly Phillips was a journalist and food writer before starting Destination Unknown Restaurants. But after being exposed to the inner workings of the restaurant industry through her day job at the Philadelphia City Paper, she decided to totally change careers. Changing paths and letting go of previous career goals can be fraught with all kinds of questions and anxieties. But Kelly isn't looking back. I think this is my story. I think I was meant to open restaurants and I was meant to be this person. I, I still get to tell a story in a different way. I wasn't always a public speaker. If you would have asked me 10 years ago to do a podcast, I would have been like, oh no, what do I say? I'm a writer, I can't talk. But I've become really comfortable in it because it's authentic, it's my truth, it's, it's what I do every day, it's what I've come to believe. I still get to write, I still get to create, I get to be inspiring to people on my team. And that has become a really valuable, rewarding thing for me. Writing brought me a lot of happiness, like seeing an article published in the newspaper. Like I would be really proud of that. But I think what I'm doing now is more of a challenge for me. It's harder for me and it's less comfortable for me. And because of that, I've grown and become you know, a better person. As your company grows, it's almost inevitable that you'll start looking outwards into your industry for other examples of how to run a business. With social media being a huge part of our personal and professional lives, it's easier than ever to get a glimpse into the inner workings of other businesses. And while this can be a great source of inspiration and motivation, it can also lead to unhealthy comparisons. Here's Andrea from Harlow. One of the things I have had to let go of as we're building Harlow is a comparison and comparing myself, ourselves, and Harlow to other organizations and startups. I live in San Francisco. I'm in the heart of startup tech culture here. And a lot of times, success is measured by funding, by how much money you've raised, by how many employees you have. And it's definitely a work in progress to remind myself that that's not our measure of success and come back to our core beliefs and our values and that we're building something different than a lot of people in Silicon Valley. And that's okay. In fact, it's great for us. But it's definitely something that I've had to work on of letting go and not comparing myself to others in this space. In our industry, everyone's trying to be maybe the most hyped brand, the most popular brand, and you're constantly comparing. And as a small brand, even like we compare with like these amazing brands who have massive teams and they hire in agencies and like will film photographers to shoot all the campaigns and stuff. And it got to the point, it's like we're comparing ourselves to them. It's like, how do we achieve this? How do we achieve that? And you have to like let go of the fact that you can't compare yourself to this image that's created by this massive team of people and probably like hundreds of thousands if not millions of pounds in budgets that have been spent on this kind of campaign or these videos and stuff and just the two of us and we're also running a business imagine like a, a Ralph Lauren kind of brand image like they are spending millions on those campaign images like even the catering budget is like more than our shoot budget and it gets to a point where you actually get a bit tired of yourself tired of yourself comparing yourself to like oh that brand's really cool we should maybe do that and i think actually no let's get back to what we do well 
and do things the most honest way possible and just communicate in the most honest way possible and stop comparing ourselves to others. Because at the end of the day, it's just like, why bother try and be someone else? It's like, if we can be uh, like ourselves as much as possible, hopefully that'll come through. We can have really closed-minded beliefs about who we think our customer is instead of being really curious and asking like, is it true that somebody in this state isn't gonna buy our product or somebody of this age? When we get stuck on demographics, we get really entrenched in a certain way of thinking. Here's Samantha from Harlow to speak on letting go of expectations around who our customers are. One of the most humbling things about building Harlow is recognizing that Andrea and I's pain points as freelancers are not the same pain points that all freelancers are experiencing. So just recognizing that this audience is very diverse and they have a lot of needs and that there are a lot of different ways that they do things. You know, Andrea and I, when we were running our consulting business, we had a certain way that we did things and it really worked for us. I mean, to some extent, obviously it didn't fully work for us, which is why We built Harlow to solve those pain points. Um, But, you know, we had a way that we did things. But that's just one way of building a freelance business and one way of building a consulting business. There are a lot of ways to build a business. You know, Andrea and I, when we were building our business, you know, we wanted a lot of flexibility. We also wanted to make a lot of money. Not every freelancer wants to make a lot of money. Some people don't have a financial goal. It's a freedom goal or it's a flexibility goal. And so we have to really kind of put aside our exact pain points and our beliefs and how we ran our business to understand that there are a lot of different ways to do things and a lot of different freelancers that we need to support. We've spoken a lot in this season of Small Business Big Lessons about visioning, the process of clearly defining what you want your business to look like in the future and then making decisions based on this vision to move towards your goals. But as you move further along your path, you may find the expectations around your business that you formed when starting out are no longer relevant, or even worse, are holding you back from your true potential. When I first opened a restaurant, I thought, okay, like, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to win awards. You're supposed to have all these accolades. And that's why you do it so that you can win this award and have this star. And I think when I let go of that, when I stopped putting that pressure on myself and I focused on just being a a great restaurant in our community and a great place to work for our team, I think that's when the restaurant actually clicked. Like that's when things started to work because it wasn't just like this one goal that we were going forward. It was like, okay, are we making money? Are people happy? Is the food good? The team, do they love their jobs? Okay, cool. Those are like great things to strive for. You should be very proud of that. When Z at Rise Up Bakery began selling more and more of his bread, he was so excited that people were responding well to what he was doing and enjoying his product. But then he had a sobering conversation with a friend and fellow baker. He's like, well, what are you so excited about? It's like, I sold 12 loaves, like the most I ever sold is the most I'd ever made. I'm packing them up. And then he knew, because he made bread too, how long it would take. And so he say, like, so basically you made like $25 for 36 hours of work. And I was crushed, right? Like I had never thought once about the money that I was making. All I thought was... I enjoyed it so much. And so I stepped away and I was really like sad and hurt and bummed out. And I realized that all of the great feeling I had couldn't be encapsulated into the money that was made doing it. After some soul searching and reflection on his disappointment at the amount of money he made, Z recognized that actually the important thing to keep hold of was the enthusiasm and passion that led him to baking in the first place. Z realized that, of course, money is important, but what's the point of making money if you don't love what you're doing first and foremost? I had to let go of the fact that it takes time and energy, and I literally just made it all about the way it made me feel and trying to get a little bit better every single day. And I feel like the moment that I let that go, it changed the whole trajectory of what I'm capable of. Rand learned a lot through setting up his first company, Moz. Insights into funding, growth, and his place within the company he helped build all fed into the way he went about setting up SparkToro. I believed a lot of things to be true before I started SparkToro that 
over the course of my first company's lifespan, I changed my mind about. It. So I fully believed that the best way to build a tech company and to be a successful person and a successful founder was to raise lots of money and have a big exit or an IPO. Uh, I don't believe that anymore. I thought that a huge portion of how important I was, how important my business was, how we were perceived in the market was the size of our team, right? So I took a lot of pride in, oh yeah, you know, I have a team of hundreds of employees and I'm an important CEO type. I don't believe that anymore either. In fact, I think that there's a lot of ego tied up in building big teams instead of right-sized teams. And those beliefs aren't alone, right? I think that when it comes to product, for example, I have a probably much less popular belief, much less kind of egalitarian belief, which is that I think great products tend to be built by very few people. I think that product is a little bit more art than science and great artists and great product builders tend to work maybe not completely alone, but largely in isolation, at least around the core concept and idea. I think that when you get a lot of chefs in a kitchen, the dishes are not as good. <laughs> um, and so I have changed my beliefs on that. And I'm now a little bit of a, yeah, Casey and Amanda, I want your feedback on this, but I mostly want us to build this. <laughs> so that's, um, that's another way in which I've changed. When you set up a company as a solo entrepreneur or even as a small team of co-founders, it's possible you'll have to start handing off responsibility and management of certain areas to other people as the business grows. At a certain point, your company may outgrow what you're capable of doing alone. Letting go of running certain aspects of your business can be tough, as Joel has learned. I think one of the key beliefs I've had to let go of or just really dig into along the, the journey of Buffer and, you know, growing and becoming a real a team and a company is really that belief that I think as a founder, you can often have of like, you can figure it all out alone or yourself, or you can fix everything yourself. And I think I've had moments where I might dip back into that and be like, okay, this isn't working well. I'm going to dig in and solve this. I think I've had to let go of that being the way to solve things and lean much more into communication and getting everyone aligned and on board and understanding the vision. And even that also means me doing much like deeper reflection on the vision alone myself and then coming back and finding the words to articulate it and sharing it with the rest of the company. That's probably the key thing that I've had to let go of and really change significantly, I think, in the maybe the last three years or so. One thing I say about business growth is that you have to be willing to get uncomfortable. You have to be willing to step outside of that comfort zone. And that's not just about the physical things, but it's the way that you think as well. So just sort of asking ourselves that simple question about money, about how we price our products, about taking out debt or giving away equity in our company. Sometimes letting go can mean totally rethinking certain ways in which your industry works. Diverging from traditional business norms can be really intimidating, and it takes courage and conviction to try new things within a well-established industry model. But by upending the status quo around wages in the service industry, Kelly has found an exciting new way forward for her restaurants. We've become used to trying things out because, you know, if something doesn't work, okay, like it didn't work. So the next day you can change it, right? With us, we really thought this was going to take time to stick. And it's been two years since we've implemented this wage model and people really like it. We've had better staff retention. So we know it works. The numbers make sense. I think letting go of tipping is tough for a lot of businesses because it's how they've always done things and, and everyone's afraid to change. but. If you're so afraid of changing, you might not be here. So it's either you change or you don't make it. And I wish more people could see that because a lot of people are trying so hard to make this happen, but it's not working for your staff. It's not working for you. It's not working for your guests. So you have to change it or you won't be here. Yeah, I'm on a journey with letting go. <laughs> Becky at Painter has been incredibly hands-on with all of the aspects of the business right from the start. But as we heard earlier from Joel, there comes a time when you need to hand off certain aspects of your business and put your trust in others. So we hired our first employee who's part-time, who's absolutely fantastic, nearly six months ago already. And they do an incredible job of customer service. And until then, 
that was by and large a huge part of my role and I would pride myself on getting back to people as thoughtfully, as quickly, as thoroughly as possible. And so it was a real, it was a huge weight, I think, even to think about the idea of someone else who isn't Hugh or I running our customer service because I was terrified about will that service be as good as we can give? Will we still feel like we have all the insights that that service gives us that will make our product better? But also it gone from being something I did for a, an hour a day or maybe a few hours in the run up to a launch, something that was like my full time job. And it wasn't where I needed to spend my time because there was a lot of other things that we needed to be doing. So I think letting go of that was a huge thing. And it's a process. It's not an overnight thing. Like I still read absolutely every email that comes into our inbox. And if it's urgent, we'll get back to it. And if it's not, we'll talk through, we'll figure out the best way of responding. We're trying to teach as well so that the people that are going to do customer service for us will give the best answer, just as good as answer as we possibly could. And that's going really, really well. But I don't think there's ever a time I fully want to let go. It's just letting go enough to have the time that we need, but also to not lose any of the benefits of doing it ourselves. Rand recognizes that it's easier to let go of previously held beliefs if you practice non-attachment. The idea behind non-attachment is to gain a higher perspective by letting go of existing ideas, of the desire for things, and of other emotional attachments. By gaining clarity on this, we can make better decisions for our lives and our businesses. I have an unusual detachment from previously held beliefs, from, you know, prior ideas. Even, I even don't have much of an attachment to kind of sentimental things in my life. And I think that it's kind of that mentality of maturity and ability to reason rationally around even things that could be very emotional, process your emotions, sort of see where they're coming from, give yourself forgiveness and the ability to let go of things from the past. Uh, I think that's what's really helped me to move on past a lot of failures. I mean, I have I have so many things I regret from my time at Moz. And also, I'm deeply grateful for the experience. And I think those two things can be tough to reconcile, but they can simultaneously exist and, and you can still be at peace. Ari at Zingerman's has written extensively about the power of beliefs, both in our personal and business lives. Whether it's beliefs about the quality of your coffee, beliefs about community, beliefs about hierarchy, beliefs about race, beliefs about religion, like they're just all learned beliefs. And once we become conscious of them, we are free then or able then much more easily to choose a new belief. Certainly, I've changed dozens and dozens and dozens of beliefs. I mean, just to understand so much more about the negative impact of hierarchy, about ways to have conversations that are more effective, about time frames for what it takes to change a culture, you, you name it. Now, there's some that I've stuck with, like I love to read. So this is something I grew up with. And that belief that I got when I was two has served me really well. Other beliefs like that asking for help was weak were very unhelpful. And so I've needed to relearn how to do that. I don't think detachment comes naturally. I think that that is something where you process your own emotions and feelings and by analyzing those and talking about it with other people and hearing their experiences and realizing the pain and the heartache and the bad outcomes that happen even just mentally within your own body when you can't let go, when you can't forgive someone else, forgive yourself, say, hey, that that terrible thing happened and it was kind of my fault. And 2008 Rand, I forgive you. It's okay. Like, you can move on, buddy. Don't do it again. <laughs> but but it's okay. It's okay to let go. I think that's I think that's a hard place to get to, but it's not something that comes naturally. I think that people who have gotten to that place have gotten there through active work on it, right? Through emotional processing and the ability to reflect on their actions and reflect on the life they want to lead and how they want to be in the world and the impact they want to have on people around them. And yeah, when you have all these poisonous sort of historical artifacts clogging up your body like a disease or your mind, right? That's really hard to do. It's hard to get to a good place. It's not going to come naturally for anybody. 
It's hard stuff. Like I, I have complete empathy for folks who are trying to work on it. You, you can get there. As Rand says, making progress on these challenges is work. And some of the hardest work can come when trying to separate your own self-image and self-worth from the success of your business. I have learned over the decades, like, I am not Zingerman's. Like, I could do the worst podcast you've ever done, and it doesn't make me a bad person. It's just separating the behavior from the human, right? And so this is at its core is diversity work. I'm not saying I'm so great at it, but it's just people are trying to guess the right answers instead of doing the right thing. And this doesn't work when you're nine in school and it doesn't work as an adult. And so I learned from Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, from a lot of other people, from understanding the belief stuff. Like if I just start with the belief that everybody is a good person trying their best and that the decisions they make may not be ones I really like, but it doesn't make them a bad human being, then I need to also apply that to myself. And when we embrace imperfection, then of course I make mistakes. Of course, not everything's going to work out. And then I need processes, techniques to help myself reground because there's failure happening constantly. And in the ecosystem, one of the dozens of reasons I like that metaphor and have internalized it more and more and write about it more and more is like in nature, failure and success are happening simultaneously all the time. And when we embrace that, then it's easier to process this reality and by contrast the judgment that you in quotes are a success or you're a failure it's not real like it's it's made up (laughs) being a successful entrepreneur requires huge amounts of discipline focus and motivation and as a result of putting so much of yourself into your business it's definitely possible to fall into the belief that your own value depends on the size profits or other achievements of your business By letting go of these beliefs and decoupling your sense of self from the success of your company, you can find a healthier way to move forwards, ultimately creating a more sustainable and balanced professional and personal life. Thank you so much for listening to this season of Small Business Big Lessons. We hope that hearing the amazing stories from our fantastic contributors over the last eight episodes has inspired you to think differently about your business. We can learn so much from each other's stories, and we encourage you to come and be a part of our community over at buffer.com slash community. You'll be able to see everything you need there. We would love to learn about you, about your journey, and any of the big lessons that you have learned along the way. This episode of Small Business Big Lessons was written and produced by Rowan Bishop at Message Heart, script edited by me, Haley Griffiths at Buffer, and interviews were conducted by Umber Bhatti at Buffer. If you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to leave us a review. 